kind of broad questions, but actually to the audience um, instead of to the panelists. We can always have these people talk more, but I wonder if we can get people in the audience to speak out more. And feel free to ignore those questions and ask your own if you want, but I, I just want to pose some things that kind of follow from what I was I was hearing from the from the panels today. So um, so first on, on positive agenda. So Carolina um, spoke about, you know, there are, some th there are some ways that we'd like to use these international processes to start getting positive norms within the documents themselves. Um, one area could be on the three-step test, as Jamie and Carolina mentioned. How do you moderate the three-step test? How do we react to the conservative WTO um, interpretations, etc. Is there something we can do within these agreements to actually change the course of the way that has been interpreted by using the ability to have subsequent agreements reinterpret agreements in the past is, is one area or um, fair use limitations and exceptions etc. So what are you all thinking about? Are there areas where you all are thinking about areas where we could do something positive within the TTIP? Um, so second area um, you know, what, what can U.S. Congress do? What can the EU Parliament do? So as I mentioned in my kind of opening, you know, the EU Parliament, its March 2010 resolution was a real tide changer in the way civil society could interact with the text. And that tide changer itself was a product of civil society activism in the European Union. Um, in, the, in the U.S. To, uh, today, this summer, uh, the Senate Finance Committee is considering uh, putting out a new, uh, you know, democratic version of the Trade Promotion Authority bill. What are we asking them to do? What are you asking them to do? What kind of language are we trying to get in that bill that might counter some of the problems, both substantively and procedurally, um, that we've been talking about? And the third kind of area is a follow-on to that on process. So what, you know, this process is going to go forward no matter what. What do we want it to look like? And plugging into those processes in the EU Parliament and the, and the US Congress, what do we think? Um, I think Gail mentioned, you know, if we're gonna do it, we should do it properly. What does doing it properly look like? Um, Jeremy had a description of, of some of those possible processes. You know, what else are we thinking about on those lines? And how do we, how do we answer the, the complaint you just you constantly hear about, well, we don't want to negotiate in a fishbowl. We can't negotiate in a fishbowl. Is the response to that, will you do in other forums? I mean, are we asking for a fishbowl or are we asking for something that's, that's, that's somewhere less than that? Or, you know, how are we constructing our, our requests along those lines um, to respond to some of those arguments? So those are just three areas. What I've turned, I've got, I've got two questions up here. So first, and if you could introduce your, your name. Um, and then we'll kind of go around the room. We've got another 15 minutes for, for discussion. Feel free to throw stuff back to the panel if you want to. Okay, uh, Kirk Carter at KEI. I was just curious on at least the TPP, uh, what's the status in terms of copyright extensions that are retroactive to works that are already under copyright? I know that it was something that was in the initial leaked version was extending, cop when you extend the copyright term, also extending it to works that already exist, but that raised a lot of concern because you can't incentivize the creation of something that's already been created. I didn't know if they had taken that out or if they were still going to stick in retroactive term extension. And we'll take a series of questions from the room before we respond to Dave. Yeah, thank you. David Hammerstein, TACD. I had some questions for well, on both sides of the Atlantic, especially um, Gael and Costas. Um, we've seen the reform chill in many areas of, of TTIP, just the expectation of TTIP can mean the reform chill or the bad legislation, for example, about you're talking about trade secrets. I don't know if Costas, for example, in the area of, of data protection, I think it's pretty, pretty clear. Um, the EU is preparing a total overhaul of their copyright um, system at this point, and there's, uh, there's been a very broad consultation and things like that. Um, do you think that the TTIP or the transatlantic relation is influencing in any way that formulation? So, so that would kind of be one. And then on the positive agenda, obviously there are many, many things we propose. And it was interesting that at the last stakeholders meeting of the last negotiating round, Pedro Velasco, um, uh, kind of with a little smirk on his face, I'm sorry to say, um, proposed that we include 
the Marrakesh Treaty along with the Beijing Treaty into TTIP and this is something he, w he was considering. So th it was actually this proposal on limitation exceptions, I think Jamie made it at, at a meeting like a year or so ago about including the Marrakesh Treaty. Didn't you make that proposal? <coughs> yeah, but anyways. So those would be one, one, one example. But then, finally, yesterday, um, a number of people, including Jamie, proposed a whole series of me measures that would be socially oriented in TTIP and asked USTR to have a two-day session with NGO groups. And then, privately, the head negotiator, Dan Maloney, said, well, you know, um, that's not what trade negotiations are about at all. Trade negotiations are about, about increasing trade, economic growth, blah, blah, blah. And so that's kind of like, so when you ask for this positive agenda, I think it's a very nice intellectual exercise, but the response from, un, from the trade negotiators is kind of looking at us like Martians. <coughs> Mike first. Okay, uh, question about negotiating objectives and, um, and, and U.S. law. You, uh, like Carolina was saying, there's a, copy, a number of copyright reviews going on right now, and there's always talk about whether or not they're going to reduce the period of specifically for biologics, but negotiators are fond of saying that you know, we're under a mandate to negotiate to levels of U.S. law, or approximately like U.S. law, but the negotiating objectives are basically also under review right now because they're, they're renegotiating or I'm not sure what, if there's a bill installed on the Hill that's supposed to say these are your negotiating objectives. So is there any is anyone better around ideas of replacing that or modifying that line of, that says when you go to the table you're supposed to negotiate what the, the snapshot of U.S. law as it's frozen in time? I'm not sure what a rewrite would look like or a tweak would look like, but it seems like just common sense says things change and it might be worth thinking about another way of writing that sentence in that code. Um, so we haven't really seen, or at least I haven't heard of any examples of how uh, trade secrets protection measures have used, uh, has been used to sort of stifle access to knowledge. Um, but maybe you guys know of an example of that or maybe be creative about how that might be applied. Um, you know, of, of course, I feel like the, the copyright industry would also get creative themselves um, to apply the trade secrets protection uh, measures to do that. So maybe sort of think about what the implications of these trade secret provisions could be on access to knowledge um, in the future. 